I would firstly like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak here today. As we've already heard this morning, how the brain learns movements is a fundamental question in neuroscience. Animals perform an extraordinary variety of movements over many different timescales. To support such variety, the motor cortex exhibits a similarly rich repertoire of activities. This is an example of a typical primate motor task where a monkey is trained to reach from the center of a screen to a target. Electrophysiological, uh, electrophysiological recordings of motor cortex are taken together with EMG muscle dynamics. On the bottom, I'm showing example firing rates of one neuron in motor cortex for many different reaches. We can see how complex the activity is at the single neuron level. Recently, computational neuroscientists have attempted to model motor cortex as a recurrent network of excitatory and inhibitory neurons, where simple linear readouts of the network activity might correspond to muscle EMG dynamics. Although such models capture many qualitative aspects of motor cortex dynamics, such as complex multiphasic activity transients, it is unclear how movements can be learned and controlled over a wide range of shapes and speeds. To try and answer such questions, we begin with an existing model of motor cortex that incorporates strong excitatory recurrent interactions that are stabilized by feedback inhibition. The firing rate dynamics of this model are governed by the following differential equation, where the weight matrix W is optimized such that certain initial conditions produce dynamics reminiscent of motor cortex recordings. Now, a possible mechanism for effectively switching the network activity to produce a large variety of outputs is to address the intrinsic gain, that is, the input-output sensitivity of each neuron through the gain function F. Indeed, we also know that inputs from the cerebellum or neuromodulators such as dopamine could cause such changes in neuronal responsiveness. And gain modulation of motor neurons has been linked experimentally to optimization of muscular control. We therefore wanted to study the effects of gain modulation in recurrent cortical motor circuits. Now, because neuromodulatory projections to primary motor cortex are typically quite sparse, i.e. non-neuron specific, we emulate neuromodulation in our model by including a set of afferents that directly control the input-output gain of groups of neurons. The illustration here on the top left is simply a rearrangement of the recurrently connected neurons so that I can clearly show the modulatory input. The slope of the nonlinear gain function f, which converts neuronal activity into firing rates, is the only part of the model that is affected by this modulatory input. We model the gain function f as a hyperbolic tan function, which is plotted here on the top right, where changing the gain changes the slope of the gain function at baseline rate. Here I'm plotting the gain function with the gain set to 1 in black and 2 in blue. So when I talk about gain modulation, you'll have to put to one side the definition of gain that Evan just mentioned, at least for the next 10 minutes, if you can. OK. So when I talk about gain modulation, I mean changing the slope of the gain function for the neurons in the recurrent network, as plotted here. To give you an idea of how gain modulation affects the neuronal dynamics, we find that uniformly increasing the gain of all neurons in the recurrent network causes an approximate doubling in the frequency of the neuronal dynamics, as well as an increased overall amplitude, as shown here for three example neurons on the bottom. These effects of uniform modulation can also be understood analytically if we linearize the gain function f and study changes in the eigenspectrum of the effective connectivity matrix. Therefore, uniform gain modulation can lead to substantially different yet predictable activity trajectories in recurrent networks. To allow more precise control of network activity than through uniform modulation, we now independently adjust the gain of groups of neurons. We use a network of 200 neurons and 20 modulatory units, which each control the gain of a group of 10 randomly chosen neurons. Neurons within the same group will always have the same gain. We wanted to investigate whether we are able to learn an arbitrary target movement, shown here in orange, through only gain modulation. The initial network output with all the gains set to 1 is shown here on the right in black. We change the neuronal gains using a reward-based node perturbation learning rule, such that the obtained gain pattern generates the desired target output. This simplistic rule uses a global scalar signal of recent performance to iteratively adjust each neuron's gain, while the network input and architecture will always remain fixed throughout all our simulations. On the bottom, I'm now going to show a video of how the network output changes during training, which is shown here. 
and on the right here, how the gains change for each of the modulatory units. All the gains start at one and then diffuse outwards during learning. And we can see that after some time, the network output in black begins to resemble the target movement in orange. And the gains have changed for all of the modulatory units. Errors between the actual and desired outputs tend to decrease monotonically and eventually become negligible, as shown by the red learning curve here on the bottom. Importantly, we also achieve a similar learning performance using alternative models of movement generation that rely on additional preparatory periods or altogether different chaotic dynamics. Therefore, in all of these models, neuronal gain modulation alone can cause dramatic changes in the network output without requiring any changes in synaptic architecture or inputs. In the example I just showed, we used 20 modulatory units, which each control the gain of a group of 10 randomly chosen neurons. In fact, we find that this realistically sparse control of the neuronal gains provides a similar performance to the case of every neuron being independently modulated, as shown here on the bottom. Furthermore, we find that network size hardly affects learning performance for a fixed number of groups. Now, for the remainder of the talk, I'll use a 400 neuron network and 40 modulatory groups. So what I've shown so far is that we can obtain game patterns that generate desired target outputs without requiring any changes in the synaptic architecture. In principle, though, it's possible to independently learn numerous gain patterns, supporting the possibility of a library of modulation states that the network can switch between to generate a large variety of outputs. Indeed, generating new movements would be much more efficient if new game patterns could instead be intuited as combinations of previously acquired game patterns or motor primitives. To test if this is possible in our model, we first approximate a novel target movement, which is shown here in gray, as a linear combination of existing movements using a least squares fit. This is illustrated here, and we'll term this fit, and it's shown here in dashed red. Now, with the fitting coefficients we use from the least squares fit, we now generate the same combination, but this time of the associated library of gain patterns. This then creates a new gain pattern, which is shown here in orange, and interestingly, when we apply this game pattern to the network, the resulting network output also closely resembles the target movement. Now, this means that game patterns can be combined to generate new movements in a predictable manner. Furthermore, with an increasing number of game patterns in the movement library, the network output error tends to decrease on average, as shown here on the right. Although the idea of using motor primitives to rapidly generate new movements is well established, our model proposes the first, to our knowledge, circuit-level mechanism for achieving this objective. So far, we have seen that simple group-based game modulation enables control of muscle activity lasting for a fixed duration approximately half a second. We next investigated if game changes are able to control the speed of an intended movement. So firstly, we asked, can we learn a game pattern that generates the same movement shape but lasting five times longer, so in this case, 2.5 seconds. Interestingly, we find that we can learn a game pattern that generates this slower output variant, and the network activity now decays more slowly, possibly as expected. Therefore, the temporal scale of the transient neuronal activity can also be extended several fold through specific changes in the neuronal gains. We next asked if it is possible to simply linearly interpolate between the learned game patterns for the fast and slow variants and generate smooth speed control of the movement. To illustrate this, you can imagine the game patterns for the fast and slow variants sitting in a 40-dimensional gain space because we have 40 independent modulatory units, where, for example, gain one here on this axis might correspond to the gain of neurons in one group, and gain two here might correspond to the gain of neurons in another group. And then we asked, can we simply linearly interpolate between these two gain patterns, effectively by turning up these gain dials up or down, respectively? By modifying our training procedure, and now including five additional evenly spaced speeds in between the two gain patterns, we find that linear interpolation now generates smooth speed control of the movement. In other words, to control movement speed, we learn a manifold in neuronal gain space that is delimited by the fast and slow gain patterns. Here I'm showing such control of a movement following training. 
Here, I'm now plotting the same movement and at five different points along the game manifold. And we can see that the movement is fairly accurately reproduced at the different speeds. We finally wanted to combine the effects of gain changes that control movement speeds with the results I showed earlier, where gain changes affect only the movement shape. A relatively simple possibility is to find a single universal gain manifold that controls movement speeds and combine it with gain patterns associated with different movement shapes, where the product of any one of the shape-specific gain patterns with any point along the gain manifold generates the desired movement at the desired speed. Here, I'm showing the output of a gain pattern for one particular movement shape multiplied by a point on the gain manifold that generates fast movement outputs, now by the point on the gain manifold that generates medium speed outputs, and finally, for the slow outputs. This is also another example of a different movement shape at the same three speeds. We can therefore obtain separate families of gain patterns for movement shapes and speeds that independently control movements in space and time. In summary, our findings build on the established effects of neuromodulation by showing that a recurrent network's computations can be controlled without changing its connectivity by modulating only neuronal responsiveness. We showed that a relatively small number of modulatory units provide sufficient control of network activity, that previously learned game patterns can be combined predictably to generate new movements, and that it is possible to independently change movement speed while preserving movement shape. I want to thank my supervisors and the Vogels Group for their incredible support over the last few years, and thank you very much for your time. We do have time for questions. Just a question about the combination of primitives. So this is a highly nonlinear system. Um, all, the, all the other stuff are sort of continuous and could be expected, but when you combine the <coughs> primitives with the gain function, um, how do you explain the fact that it's sort of linearly uh, sure. combines? <clears throat> so for all simulations, excuse me, <clears throat> for all simulations, we used um, the nonlinear gain function, and we used a baseline firing rate of around 20 hertz. And so this means that, in this case, a lot of the dynamics are close to the linear regime. And we find that, analytically, uh, there's a way to show that this result is expected, that linear combinations of the outputs produce a similar result to linear combinations of the game patterns. And we can talk afterwards, but you can show analytically that this is expected. Also, we, we reduced the baseline firing rate down to 5 hertz, and we get substantially more nonlinear behavior, and the result still holds. As you, as you make the dynamics more and more nonlinear, by reducing the R0, this result does start to go, as you would expect. So, yeah. <clears throat> uh, nice work. Thank you. So in, uh, so in spiking networks, we think a lot of what controls the gain is sort of the background activity the cells get and the shape of that within the, the shape of the memory and potential distribution. Excuse me. So I'm wondering, have you thought about how you might change this FI the FI curves you're showing? So what do you think the biological implementation of change in the gain might be? So what mechanisms might result in the gain modulation? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so, so I touched on it just at the beginning as a motivation. Um, one possibility, uh, which is perhaps most likely, is just some external circuit, like the cerebellum or, or, or the thalamus, might be <coughs> synapsing onto the motor circuit. And just changes in the background firing rate of this circuit could cause the gains to change up or down. Or neuromodulators such as dopamine it could, could cause such such things as well. I was wondering if you get more flexibility out of a gain library of a particular size than you would out of a library of directions in which you could perturb the connectivity matrix via some sort of modulation. So, so can you just repeat again? Sure. Let's say here you have k different directions in which you can uh, perturb the gain. Imagine you had k different directions in which you could perturb the connectivity matrix, mm -hmm. k different base uh, library matrices. Uh, do you have a sense of which of the two strategies would give you more flexibility? So uh, f for sure, with, with the gain libraries, we have less parameters. Yeah. But then I don't know how you would have a library of synaptic connectivity matrices. I, I, I don't see how that, that might occur easily. Um, but for sure, there's many more parameters if you change the synapse. Yeah. 